Today is a special day. It's a special day because, but most of us in our stream of Christianity don't know why. And so um, I want to share a message with you today about greater things, believing, I believe, for 2019. Let me put this seed in your spirit. I believe for 2019 that God would release greater things in you and through you. How many of you can receive that? That God would release greater things in you and through you. Three people here received it. The rest of you are just missing out. You're writing it down. Okay, that's great. The people who are writing it down are going to get even greater, greater things. Now, today is Epiphany. How many of you knew that today was Epiphany? About five or six of you. Epiphany is always January the 6th. It's 12 days after Christmas, and um, it is a tradition uh, of, I, I, should, I would say, the church. You say, well, what church is that? It's not our tradition. Uh, no, but it is a tradition of the church that started way back in the 200, 300 A.D. time, time frame. And um, I'd like to give you a lot of details on it, but um, I don't have a lot of details. Uh, but I do have a few that I want to I look at this morning. Uh, as we look at that. But last week, we, uh, we moved, we spent our Advent looking at the mess of Christmas and how God comes into our mess and how we can see Him in the mess and hear Him in the mess of our lives. And, and then we ended last week by, by moving from the mess to the message and focusing more on the good news of, of overall of the message of Jesus coming. And so we talked last week about three things. We talked about the fact that God remembered us in our lowest state. He remembers us no matter what our condition. Secondly, he rescued us from the adversary. So God is at work actively doing battle on your behalf, on my behalf. He rescues us from the adversary. And finally, the, the Bible said in Psalm chapter 136 that he gives food for, to everybody. He provides for us what we need. So he remembers us, he rescues us, and he provides for us. As we've gone through the Advent season, though, um, we have we have dis- all of the announcements, all of the message, everything that we've studied up to this point was good news. How many of you would agree it's good news? The good news of Jesus coming, the good, but it was good news. If you read it in the context of the scriptures, it was good news to the Jews. Joseph and Mary were Jewish. Elizabeth and Zechariah were Jewish. Bethlehem was a Jewish town. Israel was a Jewish nation. All of the good news came to the Jews. But today we're going to transition and we're going to move because it's Epiphany. And I will say this. I do know this. Epiphany in the Eastern Orthodox Church celebrates the baptism of Jesus. Epiphany in the Western part of the church, which we would be uh, coming out of and be a part of, celebrates the reality of the three magi coming to visit Jesus. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Not that they came 12 days later. It's not a, it's not a, a biblical um, calculation that you can say, well, 12 days later, the, the wise men showed up at the, at the manger. It's not, nothing like that. As a matter of fact, I could not find out why it was 12 days. Uh, so I don't think the song was written before the 12 days. I think the 12 days song came after the 12 days. So I don't think it was that. But there, but there were these 12 days later, there's this celebration. But it's a significant event. And here's what I want, I want to say to you about it today. First of all, the meaning of epiphany is revealed or revelation, revealed. And so epiphany is the day that significant things about Jesus are revealed. And one of the greatest things about epiphany in celebrating the, the, the magi coming or the wise men coming or whatever you want to call them, in celebrating them coming, they were not Jewish, right? The, the, they, they were not Jewish people coming to celebrate a Jewish Savior. They were Gentiles, and that's good news for you and me, most of us. I don't know if anybody here has, 
has uh, Jewish blood in them, in their line somewhere, but most of us all come from Gentile roots. And what's good about this is that the Magi were Gentiles means this. God, when he sent his son to save the world, didn't just send his son into the world for the Jews, but he sent his son for everybody. And one of the evidences of that is that he put this star in the sky way out here over in the east and the Magi saw it and followed it. And the Magi as Gentile rulers, as Gentile leaders, as Gentile uh, Magi, they come and they worship Jesus. And it is a revelation. Epiphany means revelation. It is a revelation to the nations that Jesus came not just for the Jewish nation, but for every nation of the world. And that is good news. Somebody say amen. So, most of us haven't celebrated Epiphany. As a matter of fact, uh, just a quick question. How many of you have ever, in any way, you've celebrated Epiphany? Uh, so, a, a few of you have celebrated. How many of you celebrate it every year? Uh, just one or one and a half. Um, the hand raised this way is half. I count that as half. Well, sort of. Uh, here's what I want to say about Epiphany. It's not a biblical holiday. So don't, don't worry because you've been missing out on something. It's a tradition, but traditions are not all bad things. And it's a tradition that I think you can incorporate into your family. I believe that it's, it's one of the key things that you can incorporate into your family that will allow you to do what you're called to do as a family. And that is to teach your children about the faith. Epiphany, if you will take it, by the way, in, in many nations still in the Middle East and, and elsewhere, Epiphany is the day they give gifts. Because the wise, the Magi gave the gifts, and, and so it's based on that as opposed to what we do, which is on Christmas Day. In any case, Epiphany can become one of those things that you use as a tool. I believe if you're like me and you have kids and you understand that it's your responsibility to disciple your children, I need every tool I can possibly get to give them things that they can hold on to. And Epiphany is one of the things they can hold on to. If you would establish a tradition in your home of Epiphany, you would have these some of the key points. I'm going to share with you today to be able to take with you. Deuteronomy 11 and Psalm 78 make it very clear. It is the parent's responsibility to disciple their children. And it's one of the values that we have at River Oaks is we want to help you find ways to disciple your children. Too many Christians in our culture have left it up to somebody else to disciple their children. The Sunday school teachers or the youth group leaders or somebody else. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. So that's my little um, message on that. It really wasn't even a part of the notes. Here's what I, epiphany can become a tool if you'll let it become a tool to help you establish for your children a tradition and a faith that is deeply rooted. So let's go back now to the past couple of weeks. We have seen God reveal the reality of his son Jesus in several ways. First of all, and this is significant, first people who this was revealed to, besides the prophetic. So when we're talking about the actual nativity story, the first two people who hear and understand about Jesus are Mary and Elizabeth. Maybe Joseph. Maybe Joseph had the dream before she went to see Elizabeth, but I'm not sure. Mary obviously has the revelation, right? The, the angel comes and reveals to her. And Elizabeth, the Bible says that when Mary comes, she has this prophetic revelation because the baby inside of her leaps because she says, you are carrying the savior of the world. And so women are the first ones that God reveals his amazing savior to. Secondly, God reveals his savior to men. Zechariah knows that his son is going to be the forerunner to the savior. And Joseph obviously has a dream where he is, he's, he's spoken to directly by an angel that says, this is the savior. You, you should, um, you know, follow through with the plans you have to marry, marry, Mary, and all of that good stuff. Uh, thirdly, he is revealed to the lowly, if you will, or the lowest, or the shepherds. So this is a revelation. Again, this is all Jewish people, but it's still a picture of the revelation that is happening. He is revealed to the highest. The, the angels come, and they are, they are declaring the, sal the salvation of the world has come. And he's revealed also, interestingly, he's revealed to a king who is Herod. Now, he's revealed to the king because, though, he had been revealed to the magi. 
which, which just so you get a picture of who the Magi are and where their sphere of influence is, they were at least people who the king would want to sit down with and hear from. So they had some status, whether, whether we would call them kings or not, probably not really arguable, but magi, wise men, wise guys, whatever you want to call them, they had this status. So they were at the upper echelon. So you have the shepherds, you have the upper echelon, you have the women and the, and the men. It's a general revelation. Today we celebrate the revelation to the magi, the kingly or the highest level of society, if you will. But just as important as that in the, in the list of people who, are reve who it's revealed to is that the Magi, again, are Gentiles. So why does that matter? So today, when we celebrate Epiphany, we remember God's promise way back in Genesis. In the beginning, not in the beginning, on the first, first words of the Bible, but in the beginning of the revelation of God in the book of Genesis chapter 17, God speaks to Abraham. And Abraham, if you know your biblical history at all, Abraham is the father of the nation of Israel. And God says to Abraham two things. He says several things, but these two things I want to remind you of. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to really move in your life. And, and it's really an amazing promise and it's fantastic. I mean, if God came to you today and he, and he sat you down and he said, I am going to bless you and I'm going to make your family for generations a blessing, you would receive that as a great blessing, wouldn't you? And God does that to Abraham. And we all know about that promise, but most of us, also know that following that promise, he said, I'm going to bless you and, everybody say and, so there's more to the blessing. Out of the blessing of Abraham comes and all the nations of the world will be blessed by you. So Genesis, when God blesses Abraham, it wasn't just so Abraham would be blessed. And this is true of our lives as well. When God blesses us, he blesses us so that people will be blessed because of him. Right. The blessing isn't just for me to feel good. The blessing wasn't for Abraham to be proud of his family. The blessing wasn't because he could go around and 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 uh, um, uh, let people know that I'm going to be great. My family is going to be great. The blessing was going to flow to every nation. And today is the fruition, if you will, of that blessing going to the Gentiles, going to all nations. It is the beginning of the moving to all nations. The promise is to Abraham and the blessing comes to all nations. Epiphany today then is the celebration that God came to us, not just the Jews. That's a powerful tool for you to teach your children to understand that because in the and here's why that matters in the context of our culture, in the context of the people that we know and the people that we 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 uh, the, the the news stories that we read and all around us, there is a growing. Well, I don't know if it's a growing. It's always been there a general hatred of the Jews. There is a, there is a uh, belittling, if you will, or, or, or uh, really it's a hatred of the Jews. There's always been a hatred of God's people. And in our culture, that happens sometimes even in the church. I know of church denominations that are anti-Jewish. Can you imagine? A Christian church that is anti-Jewish, anti-Hebrew. Are you following me? That's not what we want to teach our children. <laughs> we want our children to understand that Jesus came, that the Savior came out of the Jewish nation, out of the Jewish people, and that not only did he come out, he came for the Gentiles, that's you and me, but then we want them to understand that we have been grafted in to God's people. We have become a part of the Jewish people. That's why uh, the day I was, we were preparing for Passover at our house, and I was talking to my neighbor and, and he said, oh, you celebrate Passover? He's a Christian, been a Christian for a long, long time. And he thought it was interesting that we celebrated Passover. And I said, yeah, we celebrate Passover. My oldest brother is a Jew. <laughs> and he had to think about it like you did for just a minute. But, you know, my oldest brother is Jesus. The Bible says when I was adopted into the family, Jesus is the elder brother. And so, so uh, you know, Jesus was a Jew. So we've been grafted in. Are you following me? So epiphany, even though it's just a tradition, it's not a biblical holiday, can become a, a valuable tool for us to say, God came in Jesus through his people 
and he gave us salvation as Gentiles so that we could be grafted in and become a part of the promise of Abraham. Did you know, by the way, that every promise God gave to Abraham is yours in Jesus? I say it again. Every promise he gave to Abraham, every promise he gave to his people, it's yours in Jesus because you have been brought into the blessing of God's people. Would you say that's good news? That's good news. That means that, means that unlike many Christians today, we don't spend all of our time in the New Testament finding promises, but we look back at the Old Testament of promises. We see the promises God gave to his people thousands of years ago in, when, before Jesus was born, and we say, that's my promise. That's my promise. That's my promise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this a little bit later, but the other day I was reading in my, in my personal prayer time, in my time with God, and in, in Psalm chapter 19, verse 29, this, this promise stuck out, stuck, stuck out. It stuck out to me. You write that word down too. Stuck out. S-T-O-O-K. It stood out to me. It also stuck out to me. It said this, verse 29. For by you, by God, I can run upon a troop, and by my God, I can leap over a wall. Now, physically, I didn't take that as a, as a physical reality, unless the wall's very short. I did take it, however, as a great encouragement. What authority and what power and what ability to run over the enemy and to take authority over the enemy that God gave me. It's a promise to me. That's my promise. Just like it's your promise. That's what I'm saying, that, that epiphany helps to put some of this stuff together. And it's something, that, it's a tool that you can use to help your children and to help yourself remember. It's not just about God's Jewish nation. And, and it's not just, listen, sometimes we say this. God came to save the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we say that. But we, if we don't understand the richness of the context of how that happened, we miss so much of what God wants us to experience in our life with him. And so Epiphany is one of the days that puts that together. Now, I've got to move on. So last week, we moved from the mess to the message. The good news is that he rescued us. He remembered us. He provides for us. And all of that is really good stuff. This week, we're going to move a little bit further into the message. We're going to sort of expand on the message. And today, we're going to add this. And that is, God became a man to be king. God became a man to be king. One of the things that we, we, don't really, we don't really talk so much about is that Jesus is king. I mean, we say it, you're, you're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Well, what does it mean that he became a king? Why did he have to be a king? Why does it matter that he is a king? God became man to be king. Would you say that with me? God became man to be king. Say it with me. God became man to be king. See, again, that's a phrase you can teach your children. It's going to bring a richness. I want to show you how that works uh, in our, in our relationship with God. So uh, one of the things that we, we know about Epiphany in our celebration of the Magi is that they brought three gifts, right? How many of you know that they brought three gifts? Raise your hand if you know they brought three gifts. Okay, good. So most of us know that they brought three gifts. Three gifts were what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Three gifts. Why do those three gifts matter? And maybe you've heard some teaching on this. One of the traditions holds that they signify three key realities about Jesus. So here come the Magi, and they're coming to see what they understand as the Savior of the world, but also a great king being born. They came to worship a king, and they came to worship a man, a boy, but, the, but a, a human, and they also came with gifts indicating they came to worship God. Gold by the way, is a gift for a king. You give gold to a king. Myrrh is a gift for a man largely because it has to do with burial. And how many of you know that everybody dies? If you haven't learned that yet, it's, it's reality, right? So, so humanity dies at some point and myrrh is the anointing um, uh, element, thank you, for, for a burial. And then frankincense is an incense, right? And we offer day and night, night and day, let incense arise. We offer incense to God. So frankincense is for God. Myrrh is for man. 
and gold is for a king, symbolizing for us, helping us to grasp this reality. God became man to be king. So you see him there, God, man, and king. So would you say that with me again? God became man to be king. God became man to be king. It's a teachable reality for us with our children. He is God. He chose to be man so that he would take the place of king on David's throne. Prophecies, promises that God made over the course of history. God became man to be king. Now, what I'm going to do today, because I kind of got excited about this, and you have to be careful when I get excited about things. And I actually, I actually brought Caleb into my room the other day. I said, I said, here's what I'm thinking about Sunday morning, and and help me look through this. Does this look like does this look like too much of a stretch or a stretch? And he goes, No, that makes sense. So if it doesn't make sense to you, it made sense to Caleb. <laughs> I want to tie this reality that God became man to be king to a vision and a mission that God has given to us as a church. Those three principles, God, man, and king. And again, so this you can take with you. You you have teachability for the kingdom of God and God's purposes. And now you can take it and you can apply for who we are as a church. So I think on on the screen, we're going to put our vision up there. And it says this, River Oaks will be a family in which people live in Christ passionately Connect with others authentically and engage the world purposefully. Just right off the bat, does anybody see some parallels there? Uh, I'm going to try to make the parallels for you. So if we put the next slide up. So we have God became man to be king. And I'm going to show you this as we go along. Live in Christ passionately is about a relationship with God. Life, all of you are alive, I can tell by the fact that you're most of you are breathing and, and you're, you're here. You, so you have physical life, but spiritual life is about a connection to God. It comes through God and we relate to God. So life is about God. And we, we live to connect to others authentically. Others are people, man. It is the man connection. It is the, it is the physical human connection to other people so that we can engage in the kingdom. You see that? I don't know. That's exciting to me. Is that exciting or even interesting to anybody else? If not, we'll just wrap things up and go home. I, I was pretty excited about it because I, because it helps us to see why, why does live matter? Why does connect matter? Why does engage matter? Because God became man to be king. These three things mattered to God enough that he made it his reality and it mattered enough for him to show us. A couple of years ago, we sat in this room. I think it was right here and it was over there one day. And we did a little visioneering and, and we, we talked about, you know, what do we want to see for disciples in our church? What, how do we want people to end up? And as we talked about mature Christians, these things came out. Life in Jesus, connection to each other authentically and engaging with purpose in what God has called us and given us to do. And so we live and connect and engage. I want to give you a picture if I can. Sometimes I get a little too excited, but, uh, and I didn't draw these pictures. I can't draw, but I did digitally create these pictures, these images. So we're going to go down through them. So the picture is based on our, the things I just said, live, connect, and engage. So first one we're going to put up there is live. Live in Christ passionately. If you want to think about that in, in, in practical terms, it is the, the vertical relationship that we have with God. Everybody, every Christian, every believer needs to have a live personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And when I say a live personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you some some practical things that that looks like in just a moment. But this is the first thing that disciples need to have in order to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus is somebody, you have a relationship with God. Would everybody help me with my motions here? Do this and say, a relationship with God. This is the vertical. Good. You're very good. Very good. Secondly, we live to connect. God came to become man. We live to connect with man. You see that? Everybody do this. You see that? That's the horizontal. As a disciple of Jesus, Jesus didn't create us just to live in this vertical life. Me and God and God and me. and we're ha- That's Abraham being blessed, but not 
being a blessing to others. God created us so that we would live in this horizontal relationship with other people, authentically connecting with others. That's, part, that's how we, we say it in our vision. And what that means is, in our connection to other people, we are being challenged by them and we are challenging others. We are being blessed by them and we are blessing others. We are growing with them and they are helping us to grow. But it is this relationship. Would you do that with me one more time? The connection to man is this relationship. And the last one is we live to connect, to engage, and God became man to be the king. And that is, it's the same level, but it's pointed out. You see the difference? The arrows on the first one are pointed towards each other, more of a church connection relationship. The kingdom engagement is pointed out. The third thing that a mature Christian has about their life is they're not just me and God and me and my church members. We have a nice church gathering on Sunday morning and we love each other and everybody knows each other and it's just warm and fuzzy. And if anybody were to walk in and mess it up, we would just kick them out. You don't, or especially, or especially if they sit in my seat. I mean, you, you ever, on the first one, no. The second one, well, that's, that's not okay for people to sit in my seat. But isn't it true that a mature believer has a, has a living, alive relationship with God, has authentic connections with people, is meant to, has authentic connections with other believers, and because of those things, because of the strength and the prophetic reality we live out of those, we live our lives with an outward focus, looking for ways to expand the kingdom and to bring the kingdom of God to every place we, we step our foot. Amen? So you see that? Is, now, is it making more sense, the, the connection? I, I, just, I just got excited about it. Live, connect, engage. Would you say those three with me? Live, connect, engage. I'm going to do a much better job of keeping that in front of you because that is our heart as leaders for you is that you will be growing in each of those areas. I need to say this before we move on, and that is this. God became man to be king is linear. God was first God. He chose to be man, and when he became man, he could sit on the throne of David as a human. So that's linear. Live, connect, engage is not necessarily linear. Here's what that means. Live is first, but not always. Sometimes people will get engaged with a ministry or something. That it looks good, and they, they become a part of that. And then because of that, they get connected and engaged with authentic people. And because of that, they come to Jesus. Are you following me? It's not, it's not necessarily that, that you have to get live all figured out before you start to connect. That's dangerous. If you're trying to get your life all right with God before you start opening up to other people, it will never, ever happen. Do you know why? Practically, because you can't get your life fully worked out with God without other people. He didn't create you to be on your own. He created you to be in relationship with other people. And so, but if you have a relationship with God and you're living authentically with people, you might not go to a very deep level of authenticity with people before you start engaging in kingdom realities. Does that make sense? So they're not linear. We're not, we, this is not River Oaks 101, River Oaks 201, and River Oaks 301. I'm not I'm not criticizing churches that do that. That's not my point. My point is, this not linear. Does that make sense? When I say linear, you don't have to do the one all the way before you do the second. You don't have to graduate from live to go to connect and graduate from connect to go to engage. This is all a part of what we're growing in. My belief and my expectation, our expectation as leaders, that is that everyone in this church is growing in every one of these areas. Your life and your relationship with God is always growing. You're learning more. You're giving more to him. He's teaching you. He's blessing you more. You're learning how to pray. You're learning how to be effective. Your life and your relationship with other people is growing. You're learning how to love. You're learning how to give. You're learning how to receive. You're learning how to be authentic. You're learning how to, how to open your life to the input of others. And your engagement in the kingdom is always growing. You're finding new places God wants to take you. You're finding new ways to do the ministry. Ministries God's called you. Does that make sense? So we're always growing in all of these areas so that we become a mature Christian. So God became man to be king. That's what we celebrate on Epiphany. 
And Epiphany then becomes a day of teachability for us to remind us of that truth and also to remind us that there are these principles in every Christian life, live, connect, and engage. That am I growing in any one or all of those What's happening in my life in those? And that's the question I want to leave with you today. Taking it home is going to be a long exercise today. Uh, because what we're going to do is we're going to look at, at those three areas. But before we do that, there's one more thing that I got even more excited about this week. Can you handle it? Okay. It starts with that verse I read for you earlier in Psalm. That day I read this and I said, it said, For by you I can run upon a troop and by my God I can leap over a wall. I sent that verse to the leaders and said, This is my prayer for you today that you are, you are empowered, that you are encouraged, that you, you feel the presence of God and you're growing in Him. But along with that, God had me read that day, John 14, 12. And no, I didn't open the Bible and point my finger and find it. This was actually a part of the reading plan that I had. Uh, John comes after Luke. That's why I can't find it. John chapter 14, if you want to turn there. And verse 12. Actually, I think it's, we can put it up on the screen. Yeah. Would you read this with me out loud together? Would you read it together? Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Would you say greater things? What an amazing, amazing word that Jesus gave to his disciples and to everyone who believes in him. Those who believe in me. How many of you here today believe in Jesus? This is a promise for you. Everyone, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. The verse goes on in the next verse. I believe that was actually verse 13. And then verse 14 says that, and whatever you ask in my name, if you ask me anything, it says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. How many of you know that verse and you wonder what it means? <laughs> you say, well... I mean, that seems like we can ask anything. Jesus' context for these promises is that we're walking in a life with him. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. He walked in a life, a vertical relationship with God the Father, like he invites us, like he calls us to walk in a relationship. And, and I would, I would uh, help you to see today that none of us have that perfectly down yet. We're not walking in a complete union with God. But the more and more we walk in union with God, in loving union with Him, where we are connected in a way where we know His heart and we know His word and we know His promises, we begin to think the thoughts of Jesus and begin to have the mind of Christ. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. And we begin to pray the prayers of God. And how many of you know that when you pray the prayers of God, they're effective? So that everything you ask in my name, greater things. Somebody say greater things. I believe for 2019 that God, he just, he just dropped this truth in my spirit. And it wasn't for me. It wasn't just for me and just for my family. It's for you. I believe God wants you to, to grow in your faith today and in the coming weeks and months and years for greater things. How many of you would be glad if this year was a year of greater things in your walk with God? I would just be so blessed to see all of you that raised your hands just experiencing greater things. And not just greater things. Uh, you know, Jesus said, you're going to do the works that I do and even greater things. And I know there's been a lot of theological discussion that, you know, that doesn't mean greater miracles. I believe it means, I don't even know what a greater miracle than raising Lazarus from the dead, except for raising, you know, a hundred Lazaruses from the dead. Or so. I don't know what the greater, I don't know what the greater things look like, but I know God does. And this was his promise to us. And here's one thing I don't want to do. I don't want to minimize what God wants to do through me. See, we're, we're quick to take a verse like that and say, yeah, but you know, he doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean we're going to be able to walk on water. Why not? Why not? It doesn't mean that an angel is going to come and set somebody free from jail. Why not? It doesn't mean that people are going to literally be raised from the dead by your prayers. Why not? That's a limiting faith. That's immediately looking at our human eyes and saying, yeah, but it doesn't mean what he, what he means. 
I don't want to be that person. How about you? I want to look at that and say, God, help me to believe. What did the, what did the, the, um, the guy say? Uh, I believe, help my unbelief. God, take the unbelief that's in me and help it. <laughs> How many of you know we have a lot of unbelief in us? Still, just because of all around us, we see all the messages that say this can't be true for today. But it's true for today. Jesus said, you will do the works. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these. Greater things are in store for us this year if we will ask. If we will ask. You see, what's interesting is that's that's a paragraph. That's, that's a sentence. <laughs> the sentence includes whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so the Father may be glorified. The, the context is you're going to do greater works than these and whatever you ask. Somebody say whatever you ask. Whatever you ask. We were on the way in this morning and Kara saw a Jeep. And if you know Kara... You know that she notices Jeeps. Someday she hopes to have a Jeep. And, and she said, hey, there's a Jeep for sale. And Caleb said, hey, why don't you buy it? And she said, I don't have any money. Which is, that's what Kara sounds like. That is pretty much what she sounds like. And, she, and I know she has like, you know, $1,500 in savings or whatever. And I said, well, you have like $1,500. You could call them and say, I'll give you a thousand bucks. She said, yeah, maybe they'd sell it to me for that. I said, you... You know, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. I mean, how are you going to know unless you offer them a thousand dollars, right? You have not greater things because you ask not for greater things. Jesus didn't say, I'm just going to do, you're just going to see great. It doesn't say he's, look, look, it doesn't say you're going to see greater things in, life, in your life. It says you're going to do greater things. You're going to do greater things. I believe that you can run upon a troop. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I Googled run, run upon a troop. It didn't tell me anything. <laughs> Some things shouldn't be Googled. <laughs> I just, it just sounds, it, it inspires me. Leap over a wall sounds awesome. It, 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 it gives me the, the sense of, of what? Breaking the law. <laughs> break the wall. I know he didn't say break the law. It gives me the sense that I can do amazing things with God. You, do you live with that? I, I don't always live with that. That's why I think God, he, he put this word in my spirit for you to take today at the beginning of 2019 and to say, God, I don't know what you want to do. I don't know what great things you're going to do through me, but help me to be willing and full of faith to ask for greater things. Ask for greater things. And here's what I want to, I want to finish with. Now we're going to get to the taking it home. I want to finish with this challenge to you because doing greater things... Doing what Jesus did and doing greater things, I believe, comes from strengthening our life in Christ and our authentic relationships with each other and our engagement in the kingdom. We strengthen those areas and then we begin to do greater things than Jesus did. So here's what I want you to do for taking it home today. I want to I want to ask you to look through what does Live in Christ passionately. What does that entail? What are some of the things that that would look like? And so I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about. And as you see these, so, so the first one is to live in Christ. And that includes these kinds of things. It includes a life of prayer. It includes a life of worship. It includes a life that embraces the disciplines of silence and the disciplines of meditation and the disciplines of, of rest and Sabbath. It includes a life of maturity. You know, you're meant to be maturing all of your life, becoming more and more mature. And so a life of prayer, a life of worship, a life of disciplines, a life of maturity. Here's my question for you in taking it home today. What if you were to take that and you say, I want to live more with Christ passionately. I want to have more of a life, a passionate life with Christ this coming year. So God, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to help me in this area of prayer or of worship. Pick one. If you're like me, you look at them and say, wow, I got to, I got to improve all of those. 
few of you agree with me. Pick one. Ask, ask the Holy Spirit. What area do you want? A couple of weeks ago, we talked about a rule of life. This is getting at a rule of life. What am I going to say? Holy Spirit, what do you want to work in my life? Is it prayer? Do I need to become more aware of and more empowered in prayer? Do I need to become more of a worshiper? Do I need to become more of a person who lives a disciplined life and matures? Does that make sense? So ask the Holy Spirit. Take this with you. Ask the, Write those down. Ask the Holy Spirit. What area would you have me ask you for greater things in my life in these areas? Secondly, is is engage. Live, connect. Secondly, is connect. Here are four areas that I believe are involved in connection authentically with others. Accountability, discipling. That means we're a part of discipling someone else. We're being discipled. Search somebody out. Say, I want you to disciple me in my life. Family discipleship, family relationships, that's authentic, relating to one another, connecting to one another, and then small group participation and engagement. Not just participation, but authentic connection. You say, Lord, what is one of those areas that I can ask you for more of that for me this year? I want to become more accountable and be a helpful, accountable person and so on. And you can choose one of those. So accountable, discipling, a family reality or small group which one of those areas god would you have me to grow in in the coming year so that greater things will be coming out of my life and thirdly is engage as we engage in the kingdom here are just two areas it's it's pretty simple but we can break these down and that is i believe when we engage in the kingdom we engage in the ministry of the church and and that's that's not the only place to engage in the kingdom though we engage in the ministry of the church so that we'll strengthen the kingdom we're not doing it so the church will will look better and will will have a better influence in the city. We do it because the church is the core. The family and the church are the core building blocks of the kingdom. And so every church that is stronger creates a greater presence of the kingdom of God in the city. So we engage. So there are church ministries. There are church places in the church family. You can say, I'm going to connect in this. But then there are just kingdom realities out there. We support several local ministries, AvaCare, uh, Kingsway, is that what it's called? Kingsway, uh, Greater Hope, I think I'm missing one, but but we, we there, are, there are ways you can be involved in the kingdom that don't involve being a part of a church ministry. Does that make sense? A prayer group that you have at your workplace, but it's kingdom engagement for the sake of the kingdom of God. You say, Lord, where do you want me to, to ask for more? You have not because you ask not. And if you ask, he will give it to you. If you ask in Jesus. So that's that's my, my challenge to you today. Today on Epiphany. Today on a day that we normally don't, don't really celebrate, at least in our church, um, Epiphany. It becomes a teachable day. It becomes a teachable reality. God became man to be king. God became man to be king. That's that's what we see on Epiphany. And for us as a church as a church family here at River Oaks, we live in Christ passionately so that we will engage with others authentically so that we will uh, sorry, we will connect with others authentically so we'll engage in the kingdom with purpose. That's our challenge today. If you will agree with me today and stand with me, I want to pray for greater things in our lives. Would you just stand and, if you will, just take a stance of openness. Just open your hands to the heavens. One of the greatest things we can do when we come together as a church family is to just receive the anointing and the blessing and the favor and the power and the healing and the hope and the faith of God. It's those things that give us the the encouragement to run upon a troop and to leap over a wall, just, just to do great exploits for the kingdom of God. And I believe that there are many here today who have not, I know that there are almost all of us here today who have not even come close to the exploits that God wants to do through us. And I'm believing that this will be a year of greater things. 
greater things for you. So receive the promise that greater things are yet to come in your life. Greater things are yet to come in your family. Greater things are yet to come in your marriage. Greater things are yet to come in your parenting. Greater things are yet to come in your schooling. Greater things are yet to come in your business and in your workplace. Greater things are yet to come in the world around us, the city we live in, and in the employees we work with, and in the employers we work with, and, and in the and the customers we interact with. In every place where we move, there are greater things in store. So Holy Spirit, would you plant in our spirits a belief and expectancy that you are doing greater things and you are inviting us to greater things. I believe that right now, I just, I feel like that the Holy Spirit is is opening somebody's eyes and he's giving you, right now you have a picture, you have a sense, a sense of something greater in your life that would bring glory to the Father. The verse says that I would do it to bring glory to the Father. You have a sense of something that is greater and the enemy, as soon as you got the picture, the enemy began to whisper to you, not you. Not you. Not now. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. There's fear that wants to rise up about that thing. I just declare in Jesus' name, there are greater things. That greater thing that the Holy Spirit planted, that vision, that picture, that's from God. And we overcome by the blood of the lamb we overcome the lies and the deceptions and the and the stealing of the enemy and we say god you will give to us everything you want to give to us and we will open our hands and we will receive as your word says we will open our mouth and you will fill it you will give us everything that we need to experience and to ask for and to do greater things for you in your kingdom Father, would you stir our hearts for where we can grow in our life with Christ, where we can grow in our connection to others, and where we can grow in our engagement in the kingdom with purpose. For your glory, for your glory, for your glory, God. I want to invite you today. The prayer team's going to come. And um, if you're here today and you say, I have a sense that God's saying something and I want somebody to pray with me about that. Prayer team, would you come? Would you come and just be available? And and if you're here today, I'm going to invite you now just to come forward. We want to just take a little bit more time. You That word, you when you heard the, the word that there's a picture and and you felt the, the challenges to that picture. Please don't leave today without being bold and saying, God, I want to pray with somebody about this. Even today, the pictures, the visions, the expectancy, something just stirred in your spirit and you said, this could happen this year. It could be something as simple as, I'm going to really learn how to pray for others. Whatever, just a a simple expectancy. Would you come right now so we can pray together? If you're not coming and, and, and you, you don't sense anything, I just invite you to stay in a spirit of prayer. Your sense of prayer and expect, expectancy together with the family here begins to build. The Bible says that Jesus couldn't do miracles in his hometown because of lack of faith. Let your faith be added to the faith of those who are coming for prayer with expectancy.
just believe, just begin to pray. You don't have to even look up to see who it is, but just declare that God would stir. That there's more people coming. If you, if you want to come now, just want to pray into something the Lord is planting in your spirit. just believe. We believe, God, that you're stirring. We believe for greater things. God, you're stirring vision. You're stirring an expectancy for greater things. We have no desire to work something up, but we have every desire to live in your path. And in your path are things greater than ourselves. Maybe you, you just want somebody next to you to pray with you. You just tap them on the shoulder and say, would you pray with me? I want to I declare this thing that God is saying to me. I want to declare it. I want to ask for it. something stir in your heart if you're if you're young and you're you're not sure about coming forward just grab a parent and just come with them but let's let's let faith rise at every level today lord not just from those of one generation but from every generation release faith to ask and believe for greater things father in jesus name we ask you to raise our awareness of what you want to do at every age god sense the presence of God is very real for you in your life right now. I sense and feel the presence of God and I want to just declare that no matter what you have felt or what you have heard, there are greater things for you in your life. Would you just receive it today in Jesus name? There are greater things. God is doing and he will do greater things in you and through you. You will be blessed to bless others. You will be anointed to minister into other people's lives. You will be anointed to connect and to share and encourage in other people's lives. And you will be healed and you will be free and you will be set into a path of discipleship that is like nothing you've experienced before. The kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is now and the kingdom of God is being established. Your prayers have not been missed. Your prayers have not been unheard. Your prayers have been heard and God is at work on your behalf. So Lord, we say your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, would you bless us as a church family? Would you bless us with vision? Would you bless us in the coming year that we could look back on 2019 and say, look at the greater things that God has done in us and through us. And we will be able to glorify the way you have been seen, the way you have been glorified. We'd be able to praise and thank you because you have accomplished 
good things for your kingdom, for your glory. We pray because you deserve all the glory. You deserve all the honor. You deserve all the praise. And we ask these things. We receive these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The prayer team is going to continue to minister. The rest of you are dismissed for the day. God bless you. Keep praying. Keep asking God what are those areas he wants to grow in you this year. And let's believe through the year for greater things. God bless you.